Well, as Mike said, my name is Sam Gregg and I'm the Director of Research at the Acton Institute. Welcome to this, um, what I think is going to be a very inter interesting lecture on a subject which uh, many of us have thought a great deal about and uh, argued with about with a lot of people. Um, uh, but, and I can't think really of a better person who's equipped to talk about a subject like why libertarians need God. I first met Jay Richards, well, I'm thinking maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, when he was working at the Discovery Institute. The Discovery Institute is a very good think tank that's based in uh, the People's Republic of Seattle. Right. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, that's where I first, first got to know uh, of uh, Jay's work. And my initial contact with Jay in terms of knowledge of his work was very much in the realm of uh, the natural sciences. Uh, this was very much an area of interest to, he, of, to him, uh, primarily in terms of questions about evolution and how that relates to philosophy and the existence of God. And of course, all sorts of interesting debates about Darwin, intelligent design, uh, and all the associated philosophical and, in many cases, moral questions that flow out of that and other discussions. Uh, but Jay came and started working for Acton uh, many years ago, uh, and he was there pr partly as a scholar, and he was writing a great deal about markets and economics and Christianity and faith and reason. Uh, and one of the books that he wrote while he was here is available for you today, along with lots of other of Dr. Richards's publications, uh, including the most recent one, which came out um, last year, which tells you everything you need to know about why the financial industry is so corrupt. <laughs> um, uh, but Jay was also responsible for really launching Acton into the area of the production of documentaries and films. Uh, and some of our most successful uh, documentaries, The Call of the Entrepreneur, for example, and The Birth of Freedom, which I'm sure many of you have seen. If you haven't, it's also available for purchase through the Acton Bookshop. Excellent productions. They've been translated into many languages. They've been shown all around the world. Uh, they're very much the result of his work, both in practical terms, but also in terms of his vision about how you translate often very complicated ideas into visual media that are attractive and interesting for many people. Uh, since then, he's w moved on into, into other areas of endeavor. He was working at the Discovery Institute for quite some time, and now he's working in Washington, uh, D.C., or just outside, as I'm sure he'd prefer to say, just outside Washington, D.C., at the Institute for Work, Faith, and Economics, which is a, a great institute that is doing quite similar work to the Acton Institute in terms of bringing together this integration of faith, serious philosophy, and a sound understanding of economics. And Jay, of course, is extremely well qualified to do this. If you look at his academic record, uh, you'll see that he has advanced degrees uh, from a number of places, um, including, I just want to make sure this is right, from Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, so he really knows what he's talking about. And one of the things that's very characteristic of Jay, I think you'll find, is that he's an integrated thinker. And that's very important because in today's academy what you find is that there are many people who know, for example, a great deal about economics but have an understanding of philosophy that's probably equivalent to that of a first year undergraduate. Uh, and again, in the realm of theology, you find many people with advanced degrees and great knowledge of theology but whose understanding of economics is more or less, uh, uh, let's say, somewhat leaving a lot to be desired. And that's very characteristic of today's economy, this uh, uh, academy, I should say, this rigid segmentation of knowledge, people knowing a lot about one thing and virtually nothing about everything else. Uh, but Dr. Richards doesn't fall into that trap. What you'll find is that he brings together uh, a wonderful integration of theology, uh, sound philosophy, the sciences, and economics, which I think qualifies him extremely well to talk on today's subject, which is why libertarians need God. Thank you. Jay. Thanks, Sam. Oh, it's great to be with you. Yeah, as Sam said, it's saying I was here many years ago sounds like I'm really old, though. So it wasn't really that long ago. Uh, but it was before Acton occupied this fantastic space. And so this, I mean, honestly, as Sam said, I live in the D.C. area now, and so I'm in, in 
uh, the offices of a lot of think tanks. <laughs> and this in terms of just the sort of aesthetic appeal and the working environment is, is, is as wonderful as, as any place I've seen. In fact, there's some much larger think tanks uh, that <laughs> don't have such a pleasant environment. Well, I, I first talked about this, and I'm, I'm still in the process of developing the argument that I'll just sort of summarize today. I've written an article based on this, though, that is a kind of a fuller representation of my thinking on the subject, and I think that there may be copies of that available because it hasn't been published yet. It was written for first things. Um, and if you're in, in Washington, D.C., there are thousands and thousands of people that I will describe as, uh, that describe themselves as libertarians. And I, here I just, I don't mean the Libertarian Party, I mean small l libertarians. And what that essentially means, if you ask them, is that they believe in individual rights and economic freedom and reason and responsibility and limited government and things like that. Um, but a lot of these folks are also atheists and materialists philosophically, and many of them actually think that Christianity or theism is hostile to these concerns, ideas of freedom and individual responsibility and individual rights. And honestly, from the very beginning, this seemed obviously to be mistaken, but I was just sort of surprised that there wasn't more discussion of this. And so when people hear I'm going to talk about why libertarians need God, you're probably thinking, okay, he's going to say the libertarians are a bunch of sinners and they need, they need Jesus, right? I do think that, but that's not, that's not what I'm, I'm, I'm planning to talk about today. Uh, what I really want to do is to, to kind of show you philosophically um, what I think is at stake. Because what I think often happens, and this is the result of the fact that God has embedded the natural law in people's hearts, so... You know, the Gentiles do what the law requires, so they have not the law. And so they will believe in certain things that are more or less correct, more or less true, but they won't be reflective about what would need to be true of reality itself in our order for those values to be true. And so they may deeply believe in moral realism, for instance, which is just, you know, the idea that moral categories and moral judgments have an objective reality that's out there that we can appeal to. And virtually all libertarians are moral realists, at least in ways they argue. But there's some views of reality in which that makes sense, and there are other views of reality in which it doesn't make sense. And so what I'm going to argue is that the core libertarian values, and this is, this is how I'm going to define this. So the first would be this idea of individual rights or intrinsic dignity of the individual, that the individual is a pre-existing, pre-political reality that a just and limited state must recognize. Freedom and individual responsibility, which, uh, of course, implicate themselves. Reason, the idea that we can use inference and in our reasoning faculties to arrive at true conclusions. Moral realism, or just the belief that there are moral truths. And limited government. Think, think of these as the libertarian values. And so what I really want to ask is just simply this. If we take the two main alternatives for... Uh, the claim about what ultimate reality is like as materialism on the one hand and theism on the other. Here's the question. In which of these views of reality do those libertarian values make sense? And is one more compatible uh, with these values than the other? That's the only question I want to ask. So this is not an argument for the existence of God directly. It's not an argument for the truths of Christianity per se. It's simply a kind of philosophical exercise to say, look, if you hold those values and you think they're true, then what else would need to be true about the, the universe and reality itself in order for them to, to cohere? So you see how there's a philosophical treatment of this. And what's interesting is I, I don't have to really make this argument myself because what I want to do here in the next few minutes is just show you what leading materialist philosophers say about the implications of their own view, of their own philosophical materialism. They tell us, Bertrand Russell and B.F. Skinner tell us exactly what their view means for ideas like freedom and responsibility. Um, and then <clears throat> the point is simply to urge people that see themselves as libertarians and hold these values to sort of think about where they would be much more naturally at home theologically. Well, let's go with the first one, individual rights. I mean, this is the one sort of plausibly, just historically, we know that the idea of individual rights uh, comes from a generally Christian and theistic context. It didn't spring up in the first century. It, of course, took centuries in the West for these ideas to be refined. You had the Magna Carta and the, uh, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. But even a theistic rationalist like Thomas Jefferson, when he writes the Declaration of Independence, roots the idea of rights and human equality in an explicitly 
theological or theistic context. Of course, you <coughs> excuse me, let me, <coughs> that Grand Rapids dryness, I remember that. <laughs> Always kept a tub of userin in the bathroom, I remember when I lived here in the winter. <coughs> Here's, of course, a famous quote that Jefferson wrote and then uh, and Benjamin Franklin edited. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice that <coughs> when Jefferson goes, he's wanting to, of course, make a public argument, an argument based on reason, and yet <coughs> he assumes quite rightly that if you're going to justify the idea that human beings have rights and dignity that ought to be respected and recognized, if you're going to believe that in some sense all the diverse human beings that you see around us are in some fundamental sense equal, <coughs> it's very difficult to make that claim without a frankly theistic assumption. Because if you're just doing it empirically, on empirical grounds, there's no real way to show that humans are equal. In fact, we're most unequal in all sorts of different ways. We all know that. So that's why most cultures in history have <coughs> not believed this. They've just said, look, you look around. Some people are meant to be slaves. Some people are meant to be masters. And that's just the sort of ways the, of the world. Uh, it's only in a theistic and a Christian context, at least initially, that this idea of equality and individual rights crystallized. It's so powerful that, of course, it was in some ways kind of universalized in the UN Declaration on Human Rights. What's interesting, though, is that many people that would not themselves believe in anything like theism, in fact, would be quite vocal atheists, still believe this idea. And I, I don't know how to account for that, except that it's um, many people sort of draw on the interest of their, their cultural heritage, or they simply have access to the natural law. And I could give you examples of <coughs> sort of Christian-friendly libertarians to prove this point, but I won't do that. I'll pick Ayn Rand, who of course is, is well known as the, and probably the most widely read defender of capitalism or the free economy in the 20th century, and also a hardcore atheist who thought Christianity and uh, the free economy were incompatible. And yet even Ayn Rand said this. She said, man, every man is an end in himself, not the means to the ends of others. Now, the question is, where does that come from exactly? You know, it sounds like the Declaration of Independence. If you're sort of reading Genesis 1, you might get an idea like this. But Rand didn't have any obvious resources in order to justify this. And so what I think this is, is that it's a sort of a realization of a moral truth that she saw with particular clarity. But it's floating in midair. It doesn't have the kind of philosophical support that it would need in order to make sense. Now, I would quibble maybe with the construction of how she put it. Of course, God is the ultimate end for all of us. But it, it, does anybody doubt that she's not onto something when she says, look, we need to treat other people, other persons, as ends in themselves and not merely means for, for our preferred ends. That's a key insight that even a hardcore atheist like Ayn Rand believe. So the question is, okay, if the options are theism or materialism, and you're not going to go with theism, uh, what would materialism say about this idea of individual rights and equality? Well, what's interesting is it's not just that individual rights are hard to justify. The very idea of individuals themselves are hard to understand if you're a materialist. Remember, materialism claims that fundamental reality, the thing from which everything else comes, is blind matter in motion, which over long periods of time kind of comes together in interesting ways. That limits the resources that you can use philosophically. And it turns out it's actually really hard to get this idea of a human individual at all from that. This is how B.F. Skinner put it uh, in his tellingly titled book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. I, I know it's a little pedantic to give a full quote like this, but I want to sort of establish I, I'm not making this stuff up. All right? this, this is Skinner. He says, autonomous man, the idea that these human beings that aren't fully reducible to their environment, has been constructed from our ignorance, and as our understanding increases, the very stuff of which he com is composed vanishes. To man qua man, we readily say good riddance. Only by dis dispossessing him can we turn to the real causes of human behavior. Only then can we turn from the inferred to the observed, from the miraculous to the natural, from the inaccessible to the manipulable. And that's a very stark statement. But this is not a, an idiosyncratic statement. If you read leading materialist thinkers and philosophers, Skinner, of course, is a 
psychologists, they'll tell you this, that this idea that there are these, these individual subjects that can actually sort of evaluate the world around them. Yes, they may be shaped by their heredity and their environment, but they can still somehow transcend that. This just makes absolutely no sense in a materialistic context. And so what Skinner was doing uh, was essentially working out the logical implications of his materialist worldview. Now, of course, it's a kind of self-refuting idea because he himself, no doubt, thought he was a self that could write books and was writing it for somebody, right? Uh, there's always that problem, but you know, that's, that's a whole different set of problems, so we won't go into that. So no individuals. Materialism really is finally not clearly compatible even with the existence of individuals, let alone human equality and individual rights. Well, the second and probably most prominent idea in those libertarian values is what we would just call freedom. The idea that freedom is a moral good, that freedom for human beings, uh, except when human beings, individuals are violating the freedom of others, that it's generally a good thing that they'd be left to, to exercise their freedom. Now, I'm not going to challenge that. I think freedom is a good thing. I think it's a good thing for some other reason. It's not, you know, by itself a good. It's good because it allows us to flourish and to do things that we're created to do. What's funny is that freedom, this idea, is just utterly passe in philosophical circles that are committed to materialism. It is very hard to find a consistent materialist philosopher that also has a robust sense of what philosophers call libertarian freedom. Bertrand Russell, the famous uh, uh, British philosopher of the 20th century, made this point. He said, look, if materialism is true, we're ultimately the result of the laws of physics and chemistry and biology, which we had no control over, and then our culture and our general environment. And we're made up, we're the sort of sum of those parts. And so the idea that we would transcend them and have freedom and therefore responsibility just doesn't make sense. Here's how he puts it. He said, when a man acts in ways that annoy us, we wish to think him wicked and we refuse to face the fact that his annoying behavior is the result of antecedent causes which, if you follow them through long enough, will take you beyond the moment of his birth and therefore to events for which he cannot be held responsible by any stretch of the imagination. Now again, this is just working out the logical implications of materialism. Because I mean, here's the sort of basic problem schematically is again, if you're a materialist, you have a few tools in your toolkit for explaining things, right? So uh, you will probably take for granted the universal constants of physics and the existence of elementary particles and atoms and molecules, stuff like that. Um, it gets a little more complicated, but the, uh, essentially what you have is that each of us is ultimately the result of uh, countless antecedent causes that we don't have any control over and can't really control. And so in other words, the individual under materialism is just a sum total of nature and nurture. Everything, finally, you know, there's the nature-nurture debate, or that we primarily the result of our upbringing and our culture and our religion, or that we the result of, of our genetic endowments. And people disagree about which one is predominant, but notice the assumption is that it's in the sum total it reduces to those two categories, right? It's not like, well, okay, many of the things we do are the result of our nature, some are the result of our environment and upbringing, and some are the result of what? Free agency that transcends that? This makes no sense in a materialist view, and Bertrand Russell explained that. This is essentially what libertarian freedom requires. Now, libertarian freedom is actually that's not a political word. This is a word that philosophers use to refer to the type of freedom that most of us think exists intuitively. It just essentially means that we're capable, despite the fact that we're shaped by all sorts of factors, we are at least sometimes capable of choosing between live alternatives. And the source of that choice is ultimately us as an agent and not something else. And so libertarian freedom requires, certainly is, incorporates all the facts having to do with nature and nurture, but it also requires the existence of an agent who can choose and make choices. Now, virtually all libertarians assume this philosophical idea of libertarian freedom. But virtually no materialist will defend this idea of uh, uh, libertarian freedom. And if they do, they won't do it in terms of their materialism. So once again, one of these basic libertarian values is undercut. Let's take reason. You know, if you, I've got a quote in the, in the article that we printed out from Ludwig von Mises who said, uh, libertarianism or the case for a free economy appeals to the cool and detached reason of the human mind. It does not require kind of emotional uh, 
appeals. That is, the case for a free economy, the value of private property rights and uh, you know, limited government and these things, if you'll look at the data empirically and think about the sort of economic uh, realities involved, you should, by reason, follow that evidence, the conclusion, and, and hold the same views that libertarians do on these things. This is often not articulated, but just assumed that reason is valid, that at least sometimes we can use logic and things like that uh, to come to true conclusions. Well, you're not going to be surprised for me, me to tell you that materialists have consistently said that this idea of reason doesn't really make any sense. And um, this didn't just happen recently. In, in fact, Charles Darwin, who famously proposed uh, that uh, biological complexity is primarily the result of a, a relationship of common ancestry of all organisms and then a blind mechanism of natural selection and random variation, which in its modern form is blind uh, of random genetic mutations in natural selection. So you have an impersonal process that gives rise to things that look like they're designed for a purpose. But according to Darwin, they aren't really designed. And Darwin himself very quickly realized the implications of this view. He said, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the conviction of a monkey's mind if there are, are any convictions in such a mind? All right, now that's just kind of the intuitive worry, right? It's not exactly an argument, but it's like, okay, if we're there, all of our faculties, including our, our capacity for reason, are the result of these blind and purposeless processes, um, how confident should we be that these processes actually will work themselves out? This is often called Darwin's doubt. And he articulated it intuitively. A lot of philosophers, I could quote 25 prominent philosophers uh, on this particular subject, say that, that reason, this idea of truth, that we can acquire it by thinking clearly, is just so much nonsense. And probably, are there any kids in the room? I just occurred this next slide's a little racy. I don't see any too, too young of people. This is the most colorful articulation of this point from a philosopher named Patricia Churchland who I think is at either UCLA or at MIT now. Here's what she said. She said, boiled down to essentials, a nervous system enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. <laughs> <laughs> the principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they should be in order that the organism may survive. Improvements in sensory motor control confer an evolutionary advantage. A fancier style of representing is advantageous so long as it's geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chance of survival. Truth, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. Now her point is essentially that if, if materialism and the Darwinian account of evolution are true, right? So you gotta, you gotta if you think of, of sort of evolution, you imagine God guiding it, you can't do that if you're a materialist. It's a blind process. And so all of our faculties, they're ultimately the result of this blind process of natural selection. Natural selection can select for survival enhancing behavior, but it doesn't know what your beliefs are. And there are probably an infinite number of beliefs that are consistent with survival enhancing behavior. And so all natural selection can do is select for, you know, the fact that if there's a lion in the, in the sort of general vicinity, most people run away from that, right? Because early on, presumably, human beings who thought, oh, look, cuddly kitty, right? They get eaten, taken out of the gene pool, right? And then those who run away from the lion survive. But it actually doesn't make any difference what those people believe about the lion. They might think, you know, well, um, you know, the lion actually is warm and cuddly, but you gotta play hard to get, and so you gotta run away from them, right? It, that's just as consistent with their survival enhancing behavior. And so this is Chur Churchill's point. Again, it's kind of an intuitive idea that a lot of people have made, and C.S. Lewis made this argument in about six pages famously in Miracles. But the most rigorous form is by Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga, who was at Calvin for many years in Notre Dame, and I think now lives again in Grand Rapids and is teaching at Calvin. Plantinga has been developing what he calls the evolutionary argument against naturalism for, well, as long as I, I've been following it 20 years, and so in every book, uh, that he's written recently, he will sort of perfect this. I think it, the argument was pretty darn good the first time he made it, but he had a, a book on science and faith a couple of years ago in which I think he's finally 
created the final form of this argument. And if this were a different forum, I might actually go through it, but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So don't panic. This is, his, this is his basic argument. It looks kind of fancy and complicated. It's not really that complicated, but it would take me a good half hour to sort of work through it. The central point is this, though. He doesn't say it's logically impossible that we could have reasoning faculties or cognitive faculties that are general, generally reliable. He just says it's exceedingly unlikely. It's very, very improbable that if naturalism or materialism, as I'm saying, and the Darwinian account of evolution are jointly true, it's highly unlikely that that would produce reliable cognitive faculties and things like reason. Now, what's going on here? Because you might think, well, no, but I mean, if I have a true belief, that confers a survival advantage, so wouldn't natural selection be able to grab onto it? Um, and so that's the kind of the first objection people come to when they, they first hear this argument. But you know, just think of what we'll call the Darwinian backstory, okay? So cosmic history, you've got, you know, what, 10, 10 or 12 billion years of, of cosmic history without any particular life, and then, you know, four and a half billion years ago, maybe, or four billion years ago, you get the first emergence through some lucky accident of, of chemistry and physics of the first reproducing organism. And then for a few billion years, you get these simple single-celled organisms. And then you get multicellular organisms, and 500 and some odd million years ago, you suddenly get an explosion of various animal life forms and, and major phyla uh, that sort of appear over just the course of a few million years. Now, where are beliefs in all this, right? Were those initial bacteria or protobacteria, did they have survival-enhancing beliefs? Well, no, I mean, we assume presumably not, right? And so somewhere probably near the last page of this story, somewhere between the Cambrian explosion and the present, some certain types of, uh, you know, uh, bipedal organisms came to in some way sort of represent certain ideas and to have what we might think of as beliefs. But this blind process of natural selection has been culling for hundreds of millions or rather billions of years prior to the existence of beliefs. So how likely is it that these beliefs are going to be all that important? That's the dilemma. Now you realize this is, again, this is one of these self-defeating dilemmas, uh, because if you think this is true, you th think, okay, well, okay, so I'm a materialist and I believe in the Darwinian account of evolution. I think they're both true. So it's probably not n all that likely that my rational faculties are reliable, but I'm using my rational faculties to come to materialism and the Darwinian account of evolution, right? So you're sort of in a dilemma here. Now, somebody, some people will say, well, look, should I really, I mean, I have so much experience with my cognitive faculties, should I really follow this kind of highfalutin philosophical argument to this conclusion that I should be a skeptic, or should I just, you know, trust my cognitive faculties? That's a good, that's a good point, but it, it misses the point of the argument. Uh, I would say our cognitive faculties are reliable, and if they're reliable, we need to say what is probably true about reality itself, and so conclude that materialism is probably not true. That's the way to resolve the dilemma. Uh, but if you're going to be committed to materialism, you can't do that. So we've lost what? Individual rights and uh, the intrinsic dignity and value of the individual. We've lost reason. We've lost the idea of freedom and responsibility. And it turns out that even the idea of beliefs ends up being problematic in a materialist worldview. If you, if you study philosophy of mind, there are basically two camps on this. And one is called uh, the reductive physicalism or materialism and non-reductive physicalism or materialism. So that, well, here's the non-reductive physicalist. I know this is getting kind of up there, but basically says, okay, remember, everything's ultimately the result of physics and chemistry, right? And so what are beliefs? Well, if you're non-reductive, you'd say, yeah, beliefs are they're different from a like, chemical event or a neurophysiological event, uh, but they're ultimately determined by that event. So beliefs are the thing that kind of spins off from some neurological event or pattern in your brain. You admit that they're different, but the beliefs don't have any power to control the neurological structure. The structure determines the beliefs, so it's what you'd call epiphenomenal. The reductive materialist will say, no, there can't be anything like beliefs. That doesn't make sense, because a belief is about certain things. It requires that there be agents that are thinking of some other thing and thinking about it. It has these particular characteristics that just, you don't find that in chemistry, right? A chemical reaction, it's not about some other thing in the same way. <laughs>
So a recent book by Alex Rosenberg called The Atheist Guide to Reality puts this very starkly. He said, the notion that thoughts are about stuff is illusory. Think of each input-output neural circuit as a single still photo. Now put together a huge number of input-output circuits in the right way. None of them is about anything. Each is just an input-output circuit firing or not. So there can't be anything like beliefs. Now again, you're probably thinking, wait, but didn't he write a book? You know, I, I, and didn't he think people were going to read it? You know, yeah, it's a self-stultifying position, but that's just precisely the point, right? All these things that we more or less take for granted and that libertarians more or less take for granted end up being hugely problematic if you're a materialist. So there's really just sort of one plank left to fall, and it's this idea of moral realism or moral truth. Now, I, uh, as Sam said, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, so I have a lot of discussions with people of diverse backgrounds, but a lot of discussions with people that would think of themselves uh, as atheist libertarians, and they all are very hardcore moral realists. That is, they don't think that uh, our moral judgments are just our preferences. They believe in things like the principle of non-coercion, that it's it's wrong that you should coerce and force someone to do something that they think to be morally repugnant. Now, I think, I think there's something to be said for that. The question is, uh, does moral realism make sense? What would the world have to be like for there to be things like moral truths? Right? Now, in a theistic context, this is actually very easy to account for. And I'll do that in a minute. But for materialism, remember, you've got physics, you've got chemistry, you've got biology. What are moral categories? What exactly is the status of the claim uh, that it is wrong to murder other human beings for the fun of it? Right? It ends up, it's got to be something else. And again, this is what materialist philosophers will tell you. There's a famous essay about 15 or 20 years ago by Michael Roos and E.O. Wilson, who are uh, very kind of vocal Darwinian materialists. And here's how they describe morality. They said, morality, or more strictly, our belief in morality is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. In an important sense, ethics as we understand it is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. It is without external grounding. Ethics is illusory in as much as it persuades us that it has an objective reference. So in other words, natural selection is going to you know, select for cultures that think, well, people generally shouldn't you know, eat their children first thing if they get slightly hungry, right? Because there might have been a culture that did that, but again, it wouldn't tend to reproduce, and so natural selection would weed it out of the gene pool. And then those cultures that, for whatever reason, thought, well, we should, be, we should care for our children and raise them, natural selection will preserve that. And so it makes sense that cultures would have these moral judgments, but it doesn't make sense to think that they have an objective or external reference. Strictly speaking, to say, well, it's you know, wrong to just eat your child the second you feel hunger pains, right? That's good if a culture believes that for Darwinian reasons, but it's not true. It's either nonsense or, strictly speaking, it's false. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, again, I could give you a lot of examples of this, but I, I just want to show you that these are what the materialists themselves claim are the implications of their own worldview. And then finally, of course, all libertarians believe in limited government. They believe that the government generally, at least in the United States, should be much smaller. It generally, it has a legitimate but very limited role to play in maintaining the rule of law and uh, protecting people from, you know, being killed and molested by others. But other than that, the government shouldn't be involved in our everyday lives. It should just maybe maintain the conditions that allow us to enjoy free exchange and those kinds of things. Now, I, I hold all those same things to be true as well. The question is, how do you defend limited government if you, aren't, you don't get to have a reason, you don't even get to have beliefs, you don't get to have the intrinsic dignity and value of the individual, you don't get to have freedom and responsibility or, or moral truth at all? You can't. I, I can't imagine how exactly you're going to defend limited government or anything else because you've undercut the very basis by which you would make that case. In fact, this is a classic case of what's often called suicidal reasoning, which is essentially, you know, it's the guy sitting on the branch, and then he's sawing off the branch between him and the tree, right? I mean, you could do this as long as the saw's on the other side. Uh, but suicidal reasoning, you know, you're sawing off the branch you're sitting on. And so if you want to use reason and moral truth and the idea of individual rights and freedom and responsibility in your argument, then 
you need to figure out a way to do that that's going to be consistent with the other things you believe. But if none of those are consistent with what you think is true about reality, then you're essentially undercutting and defeating the own, the very case that you're trying to make. So the question is how to avoid suicidal reasoning on these particular things. Notice I haven't challenged any of those libertarian values I've talked about. I've simply said, okay, are they consistent with materialism? Well, I think you could show with some definitive uh, conclusion that they're not compatible with the materialist worldview and that consistent materialists themselves tell us that. So what do you do if you still believe that these things are true and ought to be defended? Well, then I think you should consider, okay, if those are true, what else would need to be true about reality? And so think of this in a Christian and theistic context in which ultimate reality is not at bottom a blind and purposeless process. It's not these sort of mutable atoms and molecules changing and developing over time. Ultimate reality is a transcendent, perfect, all-knowing, holy good God. And everything else depends upon that God, that creator for its existence. So there's a real world, there's real their matter and, and, and physical properties, but these are not ultimate realities, they're derivative realities, and they derive from the free choice of this transcendent creator. Then we learn in, in the Christian and the, the Hebrew scriptures in Genesis 1 and 2 that God creates one creature uniquely in his image, human beings, man, male, and female. Right? Now, if you look at this the text, and let's say all you have is a fragment of the Bible and you just get that first chapter of Genesis. You know nothing else about this God that's described in the text, but you hear that human beings are made in his image. What, what could you infer? Well, at the very least, you'd say, okay, if we're made in God's image, what's this God like in this text? Well, in the text, God exercises sovereignty over his creation. He exercises freedom and he exercises creativity. Now, it doesn't follow that we have all those things to the same superlative degree, right? God can call things into existence out of nothing. We don't have that capacity. Nevertheless, I think it stands to reason that being made in the image of God means that in some derivative, derivative sense, we also have this capacity to exercise creative freedom. And certainly, a, a God described as such is much more capable of creating something like this than a blind materialist process. Moreover, moral truths make perfect sense now. You've got a transcendent, holy, good, eternal God who has always existed and can always, at any particular time, can always make particular moral judgments and can create a world that's consistent with that moral reality. Now, I've not I've sort of solved all the philosophical problems we could imagine, but I hope at least I've shown you that if you're going to defend those small l libertarian values, you're much better served being a theist rather than a materialist. And I'll leave you with this. I think that this is so clearly the case that what is going to happen in the future is that those thinkers that are most committed to these theistic ideas are going to be precisely those thinkers who most clearly and consistently defend the ideals of freedom, equality, and individual rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jay. Thank you, Jay, very much. We, we do have time, and, and we gladly would welcome questions. Um, even if you have a comment, that's okay, as long as it's fair and nice uh, and not challenging. But questions, definitely. And w when you get the microphone, don't be afraid to put it close to your mouth. Otherwise, if you hold it, nobody can hear you. I really... I really enjoy being here. This is my very first time, and um, it's great listening to you so my brain can get reactivated from years of being away from college. Okay, now you've slaughtered materialists, but why don't you tell us how we respond to a world that thinks God is a dirty word? How do we respond, respond to a world that thinks God is a dirty word? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we live at a time in which to be a committed Christian or really a committed theist of any sort is uh, more and more disreputable, uh, more and more disrespected. In fact, I, and I deal with this a lot, it's not just that people will say, well, I just don't think that this idea that there's a God and he 
became incarnate and raised Jesus from the dead. I just don't think that's true. They actually think that being a Christian or being a theist is morally repugnant, that it's a bad thing, that in fact you believe in um, you know, this, this cosmic Sauron, you know, this giant eye that's gazing. There's actually a hymn, incidentally, that I sang as a small child that described God in this way. The, the eye is always watching, you know, and it's not, not a good hymn. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but this is, of course, a caricature. Christians believe that God certainly is just and can exercise just wrath, but the only thing that God is explicitly identified with in Scripture is love. Um, God is, in his essence, Love And so part of the trick is to try to present both in what we say and in what we do a compelling picture of what God is actually like to challenge uh, th this idea that, that God is some kind of cosmic tyrant. This is going to probably get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse because of certain things that are happening in the realm of human sexuality and, and all the things that I'm not going to talk about today. But it's going to become more and more difficult to maintain these things. And so I think the most important thing we can do is first to pray uh, that the Holy Spirit will give us the disposition and the ability to respond to people in the most Christ-like way possible, not by fudging and you know, sort of being vague about what we say, but by simply showing our love and our concern for our fellow human beings. I think it's the best thing we can do. We may die doing it, but that's still what we should do. <laughs> Yeah, in D.C., by the way, when you get, we get together uh, and talk about these things, I was in a, in a private meeting off-site somewhere a few, couple of weeks ago, and everybody was saying, okay, we'll see you in the re-education camp. That was like the, <laughs> that was our farewell to each other, so, yeah. In the uh, materialist worldview, um, in the land of survival of the fittest, what would be the response of the materialist to protecting the weak, mm -hmm. which is not rational, right. and destructive to the animal order. Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly right. In fact, you remember the late Christopher Hitchens made this argument. He was very hostile to Mother Teresa. And a, at least initially and intuitively, you think, okay, if the Dar sort of fully Darwin, I'm not saying natural selection doesn't explain some things. I think it does. Uh, I'm talking about this totalizing claim that it's supposed to somehow explain everything. Ideas like altruism, right, that we should, we should save uh, sick children so they can grow to be adults and then to have children of their own and then perpetuate sickness, right, in the gene pool. That doesn't make any sense in the Darwinian framework. And so this has been one of these kind of key problems for Darwinists is to account for this. And they, there are ways of doing it. I mean, this is a great thing about Darwinism is it's infinitely malleable. And so you could just, for any particular fact, you can come up with a story to account for it in Darwinian terms, I promise. So if you want an argument against the existence of homosexuality, I can give you a Darwinian argument. If you want an argument for why it would prevail in some cultures, I can give you a Darwinian argument. So it kind of explains everything in its opposite, which is one of its charms, of course. Um, and, and so, that one, but one of the perennial problems has been this problem of altruism. And the, the general way in which it's argued is to say, okay, yeah, if, we were, if natural selection were just acting on individuals, it wouldn't make sense. But natural selection, over long periods of time, it, it operates on whole collections of people. Think of all people groups or societies or cultures. And apparently, because people are altruistic, it must be the case that cultures in which some people are altruistic end up having a survival advantage over those cultures that don't. And so you see, you just sort of, and, and there's another argument again, if you want to say, well, it seems like homosexuality would not, that you'd think that would get weeded out if you were a Darwinist. But then you can, here, I'm just going to make this argument up right now. But actually, it, since some 2 or 3% of the population apparently have same-sex attraction, it must be the case that those convert a survival advantage on cultures in which that happened. And it's like the kindly uncle argument or something. And so the men and the women are, are mostly going off to hunt, but it's good to have some kindly uncles that stay with the children. I mean, it's, it's silly, right? But this is the kind of argument that has to be made. And so this is what, I, to me, is so baffling about materialism because it's constantly having to explain away in counterintuitive ways things that we all know perfectly well to be the case. I mean, what do we know better than that we exist? It's hard, I mean, what truth of history or, or science or philosophy could be more certain than our own direct perception that we exist and our own direct perception that we know what it's like to act with freedom. We know what it's like when we're being coerced and not enjoying freedom. We, maybe we're wrong about that, but it's hard to see how anything else could be more certain 
than those things. This is the, what I would say is the valid core of Descartes' cogito ergo sum. It, it led to some philosophical abuses. But the basic idea is that, uh, look, if you think, then you can't think unless you exist, right? And so if you think, then you exist. Uh, that seems to me quite compelling. And so the rational course seems to be not to come up with this materialist story and explain that stuff away. Start with what you know most certainly and come up with an account of reality that at least accommodates it. Sir. In the uh, Planiga literature, which, mm -hmm. which volume or which book would you suggest that would uh, um, best define his argument? Absolutely. It's a book called... Um, where the Conflict Really Lies, Science and Faith, Friends or Foes, something like that. It's his most recent book. It's about 2010, 2011. It's in the last chapter. The brief summary I gave is from that version. What, what's happened is he's been having this debate for 20 years, and people, I mean, the first, it's not like the first version was fallacious, but he's toughened it up and strengthened it over the years. Science and Religion. So just Google that or look at Amazon, and it'll come up. The, one of the arguments uh, Darwinian people make is, uh, which include relatives of mine, mm -hmm. is that um, you know they've evolved. They've evolved beyond God. You guys are trapped back in some earlier evolutionary period, and they've evolved further. They don't need God anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering in your studies that you've seen, um, some of the people who claim these things, have you noticed any in particular substitutes they have made for God? Do they identify certain things that you've noticed seem to be worshipped? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is Paul in Romans 1, right? From the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities and eternal power have been clearly seen from the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. Because although they knew and loved God, they never uh, knew God, they neither loved nor served him, but worshipped and served the created things. And so there's always, if human beings are, as Augustine said, made with a God-shaped void in our hearts, then if, you, if God's not filling the void, something else has to do it. There has to be, you could call it a spiritual surrogate. And so the leading contenders are nature, uh, the human race, uh, or the state. Those are the three really biggies. And so Carl Sagan, right, wrote this book called Cosmos. It was made into a PBS series. He says, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. So he is conferring upon the created things the characteristics of the creator. And so I think that is almost inevitable. It's some people, you know, you think of Shirley MacLaine, who tried to make themselves God. I've never found that a very plausible candidate. It's like, <laughs> really? You know, I mean, nature is, you know, if you're going to make something God, that's much more plausible because at least it transcends you, you know. So some people go in for that, but it's mostly on the West Coast. So... <laughs> Okay. Um, in, in your writings or dialogue on this, when you present a materialist or an atheist with this sort of suicidal argument that you've been mm -hmm. talking about, um, other than just you know, disintegrating or just saying you're right or just maybe giving up moral values or giving mm -hmm. up rational thinking, what are some of the more coherent ways people try to respond? Try to yeah, give an argument back. Yeah, and I've, as I said, I've just started making this argument. In fact, I'd never spoken on this subject until a couple of months ago, and so this is a work in progress. And so I've had some interaction with people. I can say when I spoke on this in D.C. a couple of months ago, uh, people like that were just perplexed because you know, the blogosphere initially was claiming, and I think also for the Acton Lecture, somebody was saying, Oh, he's just going to say that libertarians ought to be conservative Christians. You know? And so the people that came to hear the talk thought, oh, he's saying something different and more disturbing. And so I'd say at the moment, its primary effect for people like that is just some kind of cognitive dissonance, which is actually what I would hope for. There are arguments, but it's something like, well, natural selection can select for true beliefs. Or, I mean, it, people tend not to be inclined to get down those philosophical cul-de-sacs because what happens, you get into those philosophical cul-de-sacs and you can't find any philosophers to support you. And so what I think atheist libertarianism is, is a cluster of values, some fairly solid, some not so solid, that's just kind of floating in midair philosophically. And that's why I think ultimately it won't be materialists that defend these ideas, it will be theists. I'm glad you have questions because I made, I, I clipped this a little bit so we'd have more time for questions. So it would have been terrible if there was nothing. Thank you. 
this, uh, I have a relative who is an atheist and he spends most of his time in argument trying to say why we're stupid or the arguments don't work mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And what I, I would really like to know, are there uh, atheists who live a productive life, help people or even aggrandize themselves and make themselves the best specimen? Or is it mostly just trying to argue against something? I, I wouldn't want to generalize. I, I certainly know some people who are atheists who live generally upright lives and concerned about their grandchildren and things like that. Uh, and you know, some are more lucid than others. I do think <laughs> that the sort of view of reality, it has a corrosive effect in lots of different ways, not just culturally, but psychologically. And atheists will tell you this, that the braver position is to be an atheist and to accept the meaninglessness of life rather than having this comforting belief in the afterlife and a loving God and all that sort of thing. The problem is that's a two-edged sword because you could just as well say, no, actually, if there's no God, then you can do whatever you want to do. So that's actually, you know, th that's a comforting thought for people that uh, you know, simply want to do what they want to do. There was a famous philosopher a few decades ago who said, it's not just... Uh, that I don't believe God exists, I don't want the world to be like that. I don't want it to be such that a, a holy, good, transcendent God exists because, you know, he might have some very strong opinions about how we live our lives. <laughs> but ultimately, those are kind of secondary questions to the question of what's true and what do we have reason to believe is true. Yeah. Over here. Oh, okay. We... Uh, I'm actually over here. Where? Sorry, oh, over there. I'm looking over here. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a weird moment. Um, yeah. I, yeah. The question I have is usually when I come across libertarians and have conversations with them, and I want to say not just libertarians because they're Christian libertarians, but sure. I'm thinking more, yeah, the That's materialist, right. secular, humanist kind of libertarians. Exactly. Um, it's always, a lot of times it's in the conversations about the role of, of the church and religion in society and the state right. and its role. and. What comes to mind, for instance, is with Oklahoma City when that organization, Satanist organization um, out of the Northeast one, is right. know, trying to prove a point and put uh, a statue of, of uh, you know, Satan essentially with the two little children on the side um, yeah. as a statue there next to the Ten Commandments. And yeah. say, therefore, you know, trying to prove a point, we can't have any kind of religious uh, connotation um, in society as right. a result, but we still need to maintain civil liberties and rights and limited yes. government, these kind of issues. And so, so my question is, how much of this will, will eventually collapse in on itself? Because we have, you know, we have in our you know, document all, you know, we base our rights and liberties based on the creator. The creator has endowed yeah. us with these. And yet at the same time, we have, you know, those who are trumpeting saying you cannot have any sort of God. I mean, now yeah. you even have to have a Satanist uh, who, yeah. who is not even a God. I yeah. mean, it's the force of evil. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a religion. Yeah. And so you have to, to eviscerate all, all sorts of references to a creator. <clears throat> That's right. And yet it's, in our, you know, it's the basis of our liberty. So yeah. how much of this eventually just collapses in on itself as yeah. a nation? I think it has to collapse ultimately. The only question is whether there's something uh, that catches it. And, and that's sort of the whole point of my talk uh, today is to say, look, the, the, uh, these values ought to be defended. I think they're true, but they're not going to be sustained culturally over the long term if we make claims about reality that contradict them. Um, and so this is what's so perplexing, is that someone can you know, decry the existence of theistic religion and its effects on culture, and then make appeals to things that only make sense in that context. And so I think you know, the first step in a remedy is to just make this clear to people, that look, you're actually undercutting the very basis for some of the arguments that you're trying to make. If you believe human beings ought to be treated with dignity, whatever their kind of economic value or their social status, then you want to work your way back from that belief and find out, okay, what would be true then if that were a, a correct belief? And people aren't doing that generally. Okay. Um, before I get to my question, I want to make sure I understood what you were saying. You're not saying that libertarianism necessarily um, uh, requires the presence of theism. 
uh, but you are saying theism is um, consistent and indeed preferable because it is most consistent with the values of freedom uh, and the that, like. That's right. That's my general argument. And I think theism is true and that there are arguments for that. But in this case, I'm essentially saying that if you're looking for a kind of philosophical or metaphysical context in which these ideas make the most sense, they make far more sense in the theistic than the materialistic framework. Okay. So now let us assume a world where it's, that's not predetermined, where there's freedom. Yeah. Okay. Um, whenever I've studied whatever philosophers there are in the area, I never come comfortable with, I've never comfortable with the notion of where value comes from mm -hmm. uh, other than through theism. Uh, yeah. So I probably on the same wavelength with you there. But my question then is, and there's lots of theisms, okay, but let's take, sure. the, let's take the Christian one. Let's yeah. go right to the core that you gave us, love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love is self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Love is caring about the one that's next to you. Mm -hmm. So how do we square that at kind of theism with a libertarianism that goes so far as to say me and my property and self-responsibility Great to apply to yourself, but certainly don't hide behind it to deny the needy. Now, I want to go one step further. Take care of the person that's next to you, but what if you by yourself cannot, mm -hmm. and a collective effort is necessary? Right. Now we get to the state, and how do you keep from getting to the welfare state? Yeah, that, that is an impossible question to answer briefly. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I didn't say that everything that libertarians or particular libertarians believe, I think, is sort of fully defensible. Um, that's why I sort of defined at the beginning these core libertarian values that I think are shared by Randians and, and you know, people that follow Murray Rothbard and all, the, all those kinds of people. Uh, I do think, just to sort of give the briefest answer that I can, I think that kind of secular libertarianism intuitively because of the natural law has a clear sense of the individual and the individual's rights and responsibilities and the individual's existence. But they don't have a very good account of the fact that we are intrinsically social beings. And so yes, we're individuals that exercise our freedom and every one of us came into the world naked and naked we will leave the world. We were born at a time and place into parents, not of our own choosing. We're the, in part shaped by that upbringing. We depend upon others for years. And in society, we depend upon each other. And so I think what you have to have to finally get a coherent way of accounting for this is to have a way of accounting both for our intrinsic sociality. That doesn't mean socialism. Socialism is the error of making our sociality purely part of the state, purely political. There's a sociality to us. It's a part of our nature intrinsically. And you need to account for that as well as our individuality. And then I think a lot of these questions sort of work themselves out. But what you're perceiving, I think, is a, a tension between those two things. Most, I've never met any libertarians that say, well, I just think if you're poor, you should starve to death. I mean, nobody really thinks that. They just, generally what they think is that, well, no big government solutions to the problem don't work. There are better ways to do it. That's usually the and I think in many cases that's correct. We have time for one more question. One more. Okay. The scaffolding that you've uh, constructed, outlining the libertarian philosophy, if you will, or the basis of it, is that the ground on which the current day libertarian political party uh, is based? And are they adhering to that, or are they even aware of what you're talking about? Secondly, mm -hmm. pertaining there to Ron Paul, probably the, the leading, right. know, okay. Does he give them a bad name to some extent because he is anti-Israeli, arguably anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. and an economic isolationist? Or is there that strain in the current day Libertarian Party? I, I think it's a kind of a diverse thing and it depends upon the part of the country you're in. If you're in Texas, there are people that are Libertarians that are also pro-life and pro-traditional marriage, or they just want the government to be much more limited and the economy to be much more free. In D.C. or in Seattle, where I lived until a few months ago, you get uh, 
uh, a really kind of different kind of thing. And so if you, if you saw the Ron Paul sticker, for the most part, I had some conservative Catholic friends that voted for Ron Paul, but if you see a bumper sticker for Ron Paul in Seattle, it was almost always somebody that was really wanting drugs to be legalized. I mean, it was like 100%. That was the, the only thing they cared about, right? And so there are these kind of idiosyncratic things. Um, I, I actually think other than that, though, it's just the kind of bad fashion sense that a lot of libertarians have that's the main problem. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that there is a, you know, there's a reason that what's called libertarian populism is becoming popular. And it's because of its widespread disaffection with the growth of the state in Washington, D.C. And I think that's generally a healthy movement. What I'd just like to help contribute to is a kind of way of making those points and defending those ideas, but in a way that's consistent with other very important things. And I think sort of libertarianism is a movement. There are Christian libertarians, um, and some people would call me that. But I, I think as a sort of intellectual movement, it hasn't really worked these things out consistently. And so, you know, I, I had friends that were farmers living on an island, um, Catholic homeschoolers that were voted for Ron Paul, but then I knew people in Seattle that, like I said, pot was their main issue. And so that tells you that there's some diversity there. <laughs> well, when we scheduled this, we knew this was going to be uh, a tremendous uh, learning opportunity. And I hope uh, you agree. Hopefully we can thank Jay for a wonderful thank presentation.